morning friends and family brothers and sisters in Christ and welcome to our morning service at Camden Parish Church. I sure hope that you had a lovely week. Um, I'm sure that it was fun filled with uh, different seasons that we've been experiencing. It was quite toasty, quite roasting, roasting as you would say uh, in Scots I believe, especially on Wednesday and on Thursday. So uh, I hope you are keeping well um, and that you are healthy and that you are staying in touch with your loved ones. We obviously got some really good news from the government side also in this week. So I'm sure you are also expecting maybe to, to see some folks and friends later on next week when some of the restrictions, the lockdown restrictions are lifted. And those of you who plan to go away for a bit of caravanning or to a cottage somewhere, you would be able to do that from next week, Friday, legally in any way. So I'm hoping that this will be a good time of rest for you. Also in light of the fact that the schools officially closed on Friday. Lots of our teachers and our staff that will have a well-deserved vacation and will hopefully come back with renewed energy and strength um, for the second part of the year and the start of the new academic year. So friends, for today, we are going to discuss the providence of God, God the provider. And I am so excited because the passage that we will be discussing, uh, it's a very much debated, controversial piece of passage and there's lots to say about it. And I wish we had hours and hours to speak about this. And maybe if you are intrigued or you'd like to know more about the passage, you can also just give me a ring afterwards or sometime in the week. Dear friends, for now, I invite you to pause, breathe in deeply. As we start this service, in the name of Jesus, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you as we are with our brokenness and our sin and our shortcomings. And that you come and you come and wash us clean anew, afresh every day. And so we look to you as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, as the Alpha and the Omega, the creator of the universe of the heavens and of the earth. And we thank you for that, Lord, that we have been made creatively, intricately, Lord, that we have been crafted wonderfully in the palm of your hand as the potter. And so today, Lord, we come to you with an expectation of meeting you also in this short time of devotion and of reflection. And we thank you, Lord, that you allow us to come close to you to get to know you as our Father. And as we later dip into this very challenging passage of Genesis 22, I hope and I pray, Lord, that you will make us open and susceptible to the truth of your word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunities that we've been granted in this week also to shine your light, to be your salt, and to leave behind the nice fragrances and aromas of the gospel for those we meet whether it be on the phone or out in the street or whilst we are busy doing our grocery shopping we pray lord that you will forgive us for the times where we neglect the needs of others around us might you come and intercede once again christ for our sins and the things that we so often take for granted like your care and your goodness Come and restore us and renew us and transform our minds into your likeness. Lord, we pray for our congregation, for everyone who continues to shield, to self-isolate, people that might be sick or ill for various reasons, people that might feel a bit down in the dumps, depressed or alone. We pray that you will come and meet them, that you will remind them that they are never alone and that you are close to the brokenhearted and also the afflicted. In the same breath, Lord, we also pray for things outside of our parish. We pray for 
the stabbings that took place on Friday for all the families affected by that. Also of last weekend down south in Reading. There are so many things that happen that is terrible, Lord. But we pray that you will comfort these families, people affected, that you will give them solace and that your peace that surpasses all understanding will be on all who are affected by these tragedies. We thank you, Lord, that we can uh, reach the end of an academic year for our, our students, for our young people, for our teachers, Lord. I pray that you will give them a good time of rest as well. And so we specifically also pray for everyone in positions of leadership, for our Kirk session, for all the important decisions that they need to make also with regards to reopening the church and looking at the way forward. Lord, that we might not be stagnant or stayed, but that we will utilize this space, this opportunity we've granted, been granted to reinvent what church is actually all about. So we thank you, Lord, that you are with us always and that you take care of us all in and through your providence. We pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, when you think of God, what image, what, what picture comes to mind? When I say God, what do you see? Maybe you see something like the following image, Christ the Redeemer, the statue in Sao Paulo. You see God as this all-encompassing big figure in your life that watches over you. Perhaps you see a Scandinavian blue-eyed, shoulder-length blonde hair male model, which Jesus obviously wasn't. Or you see an ancient Greek mythological bearded Zeus on a cloud with an electric bolt ready to strike anyone who steps out of line. I purposefully typed in God into the search engine Google and I found a few pictures that I would like to show you. So one of the first pictures that popped up was this image of God as the lion and the lamb. This, this uh, very creative, mysterious tension between a God that is both the Lion of Judah, but also the Lamb to be slaughtered. Keeping that balance. Often we feel that the Bible contradicts itself, but that is a creative way in creating tension for us to delve deeper into the character and the being of God with all these different attributes ascribed to Him. The next image is one of a shepherd, the Psalm 23 image we have of Jesus tending to his flock. I also found a few controversial pictures, so don't be shocked, don't be offended by these. I'm just purely giving you what I saw on the internet. So this first picture, you will recognize this person. Let's not say too much about him, uh, but you know who he is, and uh, let's not also delve into politics. But uh, yeah, we, we, we all have our crosses to bear, right? So uh, the following picture is a man that's lately, in, in the past few years, he's either played a president or he's played God in different movies and flicks on Amazon, Netflix, Hollywood, wherever of it may be. A picture that I don't have here, unfortunately now, is a picture of the Pope. So if you type in God, often a picture of the Pope comes up. Um, not very shocked about that, but it is quite interesting. We have a variety of ideas and concepts of who God is, shaped by our past experiences, our culture, and also our language, but mostly by the Bible. And that's why it's so very important to read your Bible regularly. The more you read the Bible, the better understanding and comprehension we have of God as a father, a shepherd, a friend different images of who he is and continues to be. Did you know that God is also described in the feminine form in the Bible? I will give you three examples. Hosea, the minor prophet, speaks of God as a mother taking care of her cubs, a bear mother. Deuteronomy says 
that God is like a mother eagle spreading her wings and carrying her chicks. What about the Matthew scripture where Jesus yearns to gather his children in the same way a hen protects her brood under her wing? Striking images of God portrayed as a caregiver and provider. We further experience his providence through the personhood of Jesus Christ, a physical manifestation of God representing him on earth. The Gospel of John says it quite clear. If we see, experience and get to know Jesus, we know who the Father is. When I think of Jesus, I imagine a provider. Providing for the needs of the weary and the weak, the marginalized, the cripple, the lame, the poor and the widow. But also for the rich, the so-called upper class, giving them purpose and meaning. Providing not only services, but himself on the cross for the final remuneration of all our sins. If we understand this concept of God, of Christ, providing, giving us what we need, not what we want, a lot of Old Testament stories take a new turn, starts making sense to a different degree. One of these stories we find in Genesis 22. And I've asked Bill to do our reading for this morning. Thank you very much, Bill. Abraham tested. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abram got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abram looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. Then we'll come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went out together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abram answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abram built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abram looked up. And there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offer, offering instead of his son. So Abram called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Blessed to us this reading of his holy word. 
Who is Isaac? Providence, a symbol of God's faithfulness, proof that God keeps his word. Abram's offspring, his legacy of an inheritance, his security of all that was and is to come. But now God puts Abram to the test. Give me your son. What the sacrifice really came down to was the question of whether Abram believed God was big enough to carry out the plan even if Abram destroyed the promise, the physical sign of the covenant. Take your son, your only son whom you love, and sacrifice him as a burnt offering. Wow, now that is pretty violent. Would a loving God, the God we are introduced to in the Gospels, the pacifist, the peaceful Jesus, approve of this instruction? Again, it boils down to your image of God. Siren Kierkegaard also struggled with this and he had a theory. One of his theories sounded something like this. Could it be that Abram was mistaken to believe that God had told him to sacrifice his son? And let's be honest, it still happens today quite regularly. I don't need to remind you of the many atrocities that happen daily in the name of God. Suicide bombings, different forms of religious extremism, apartheid, holocaust, but to name a few. But God continues to work through improbable commands. And I'll tell you why. Abram believed that God called him to obey. And that's what he does. He obeys. There's no one else that will continue his lineage apart from Isaac. But God will provide. That's Abram's conviction. That's what he believes. Where is the lamb for the burnt offering, Dad? God himself will provide, my son. It's an act of worship. Abram surrenders all to God by laying down his entire future, his entire legacy before him. And so he drew the knife, the cleaver, draws it heavenward, ready to slaughter his son. And then God provides. Notice, not a lamb, but a ram. Something other than expected, bleating in the bushes. And an exchange takes place. Isaac is spared his life. The ram is offered in his place and Abram calls the spot. The Lord will provide. Hmm. And now things start to make a bit more sense if you think of it in terms of a transaction. The Israelites in the Old Testament had to pay for their wrongdoings, for their sins. How? By offering animals. They participated in animal rituals like the Passover when they'd lay their hand on a lamb's head to transfer their guilt, slit the lamb's throat, collect its blood and then burn the carcass. Very dramatic. This is important. No spiritually minded Israelite ever imagined that an animal sacrifice would form the basis of salvation. Animal sacrifices offered a very limited, temporary atonement and forgiveness. Rather, it made them long in faith for better, greater sacrifice that would finally, forever cover their sin and pacify their conscience. And so again, God provides through Jesus, becoming the lamb to be slaughtered on that very same mountain hundreds of years later. Lamb, ram, lamb.
God takes the place of Abram by not sparing his only begotten son on the cross. And by this loss, you and I, we gain eternal life. All your sins have been washed away by the sacrifice on the cross. You have been provided for. You have been washed clean because Jesus was willing to become the provision, the lamb, by laying down his life. And this is the very good news of the gospel, my friends. Jesus says it so clearly in John 15 verse 13. He says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. We've all had to lay down certain things with the hope and the faith that this mysterious God will provide what we truly need no matter how big or small. And I'm not referring to the privileges that's been taken away during lockdown. Laying, your down, laying down your life is prioritizing other people's needs and desires above your own. And that is very difficult. Maybe not as difficult as giving up your life, but it comes close. And when we do this, a cycle of provision starts taking place. The more you provide for others with what you have, the more you become aware of God providing for you in everything you need, your rams or lambs, so to speak. A quick story on this in my life. In 2014, I went on a 10-month missionary excursion to South America. I felt God calling me to lay down my life for this year, serving His church and the community there. There was unfortunately a very small barrier. I had just finished off paying my student debt with no monies in the bank. So I made this deal with God. I said, it's fine, I will go, but then the check is yours. You need to fund this year. So what I did is I drew up all the email contacts I had of family and friends and acquaintances and I sent them a generic email stating my vision and my dream which I believed aligned with what God wanted me to do. I had roughly three weeks to raise 82,000 Rand to cover the expenses for the year. On the day, miraculously, I left for training in Jeffreys Bay, South Africa, I had 83,000 Rand in my bank account, just enough to also cover my petrol expenses. Some really generous big amounts rolled in. Those I remember, but there's one I remember in particular. A widowed cleaner earning, earning a minimum wage in South Africa deposited 50 Rand into my account. It sounds a lot, but it's in rands, remember. So it's about two pounds. The transfer um, money probably cost more than that. But she gave what she had, what she believed God had also given her. And in faith, she sowed this to make a difference. And what a difference it did make to my world, enabling me to continue with this work that I believe God called me to do. And I'm sure you've got similar stories in your life of you also doing that, giving the, the two pounds or the 50 rand or whatever it may be. Do we sometimes limit God's ability to provide for us, for others, for fear of losing our inheritance, our legacy? A lineage. I guess again, it all depends on your image of God. Do you believe He's given you all you need already in this moment? Your sole provider through the death and the resurrection of your Savior Jesus. Perhaps it's good to pause today for a few minutes and also in this week to remind ourselves, all that Jesus has done for us 
to help us lay down our own lives in expectation of what he's about to do in your future. And I know you might be anxious about something you need. Maybe it's company or a friendship or you're longing for someone special or you've got financial woes or you're super worried about your family that are ill or sick or struggling with mental health. Remember that God is the provider. He will intervene at the right time. He is your caregiver. May you exercise faith like Abram in this week to come. May you hold on to God's providence. That although the promise that's been made to you seems to be fading away. God is faithful and he always comes through at the right time. It might not be a lamb. It might be a ram. But it will be so much better than you could ever ask or dream for. Amen. My dear friends, receive now the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon each of you and those you represent now and in the week to come. Amen. Have a blessed week. And we hope to see you soon. Cheerio.